لو قطعوا ارجلنا واليدين نافيك زحفا سيدي يا حسين أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي أرفني نفسها ولم يتركني أميان القلب والحمد لله الذي جعلني من أمتي سيد المرسلين قاتم النبيين طه وياسين أحمد محمود أبو القاسم محمد ومن المحبين عطرة التاهرين لانة الدائمين من الآن إلى يوم الدين على أدائهم أما بعد كان الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وفركانه الحميد وقوله الحق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وتعاونوا على البر والتقوى ولا تعاونوا على الاسم والعدوان صلوات Moment to continue with the subject at hand which is can the muslim ummah reclaim its rightful place as a civilizing force Yesterday, just to recap, we looked at the example of the Medina society. The constitution of Medina, a pluralistic document penned by the Blessed Prophet. And here is an example for us that I would like to emphasize and reiterate. The Blessed Prophet could well have said, and he was here, the majority with him in Medina, with the Ansar and the Muhajirun, that I am your ruler divinely appointed, I am Rasulullah, I am the Prophet of Allah. He did not do that. What he did was, he agreed to have a tripartite document in consultation with non-Muslims, the Jews and the pagans in Medina, had a document whereby he had the buy-in from the people of Medina to create a state of Medina which was based on social justice. There are many who claim numerous powers but rest on the basis of religion. And this commodity called religion and my truth has become a tool to oppress and suppress people. There is a movement now in reaction to that that has come up which is called SBNR, spiritual but not religious. There is a group amongst non-Muslims which has sprung up, looking at the Catholic clergy, looking at organized religion, saying that we, have, we would like to have spirituality, we are human beings, we would like to connect with our maker, but we do not want any part of this box that is being given to us, which says this is your religion. And indeed, if you go to the SBNR site, and I, if I may repeat this particular anecdote, which is on the SBNR site, where it is said that God and Shaitan went for a walk one evening. And God bends down, picks up something. And Shaitan asks God to say, but what did you pick up? And God says, I picked up the truth. 
and Shaitan says, give it to me, I will organize it. <laughs> the Blessed Prophet Islam, said something so beautiful. Mu'mineen, faith is something that is a connection with the Maker. There is a horizontal path of having a connection with the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is what we call hukuk al-ibad. And there is the vertical path which we say, this is hukuk Allah, the rights of Allah upon us, our prayers, our fasting, our ibadat, are all part of hukuk Allah. And the other horizontal axis that we have is indeed hukuk al-ibad, the rights of the creatures of Allah upon us as creatures of Allah. The rights of the makhluk created. And we are talking about makhluk, we are talking about insects, we are talking about animals, we are talking about human beings. So these are the two. And when you look at that, and when you think about that, as to what is faith, and the Blessed Prophet said so simply, in terms of serving humanity, that an act that is good makes you happy or an act that is bad makes you unhappy that is faith or else is corollary and this simple message of inherent spirituality a human being an innocent child grows up in an environment that child is conditioned by the environment that child lives in and if he has been conditioned to think well of humanity, we just heard the ayat of Surah al -Hurjat. To say that, do you backbite? Why do you backbite? The concept of husn -e zan thinking well of the other human being. And the Ayman of Sam have said so many times to say, give the person the benefit of doubt, not once, not twice, 30 times before you actually say something about that person. Even after that, what you do is give him the benefit of doubt. This is faith. This is cordial relation that the Blessed Prophet ﷺ was exercising in Medina. This was the perfect society of Medina. That was a preamble and that was a message yesterday to say that there is a level of understanding within a community, within human beings, that we are part of the human race. And you know something? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so merciful. Once he sees a mother cuddling a little infant and the Prophet asks the companions to say, do you think that this mother will ever throw the child into the fire? And the companions say, Ya Rasulullah, it is impossible. The love of a mother would not allow that mother to throw the child in the fire where the blessed prophet said that there is only 1% of mercy the 99% of mercy for the human beings has been kept by God himself this is the mercy for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we talk about Rahman and Rahim all the time when we recite Bismillah this truly is what faith is all about to say here is a merciful God here is merciful Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and if for instance I fail in un unknowingly if I fail in some duty of hukukullah maybe you know the toothpaste that I talked about yesterday maybe it went a little lower than it should have his ghafur rahim is going to forgive us inshallah but you know something when it comes to the human being the hukukulibad if you have usurped even a single ayat of somebody's right upon you, it will not be up to Allah to forgive us on the day of judgment. It will be for that person to forgive us. How forgiving are we? There's a couplet in Farsi which translated says, you give somebody 10 almonds and if one almond is bitter, they will not remember the nine sweet almonds that they ate. This is human nature. He will remember the one bitter almond to say, the almonds that you gave me, one was bitter. This is human nature.
as to how forgiving we can be. So the ayah that I began with, we are told this is the basis of human cooperation to say that cooperate with each other in bir and in taqwa, in goodness and in piety and not with sin and aggression. And that was what we discussed very briefly yesterday. Well, we just heard a beautiful rendition by our young friend Riaz about the thinking on Karbala. And truly, it is a tragedy. It is a tragedy to awaken humanity towards the basis of social justice. But I say to my friends, let us not just keep moving with Hussein in history. Let us move with Hussein in reality with the revolution and change that Muharram gives us, an opportunity to be able to revive and reinvigorate our spirits to say that we will serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we will be amongst the biggest proponents of social justice. So that from this generation rises those who can stand shoulder to shoulder with the likes of Dalai Lama and with the likes of Nelson Mandela to say, here we are, we too uphold the principles of humanity. That moment is the meaning of moving with Hussein in reality, in revolution and in change. You know, there's a beautiful couplet in Urdu translated that Gehware Beshir Pe Roe To Bahat Gehware Beshir Pe Roe To Bahat Upon the crib of Ali Asghar Our eyes flowed with tears Gehware Zindagi Me Aankhe Na Khuli That in the crib of life we did not open our eyes That we came We celebrated we commemorated the 12 days of Muharram and beyond as the tradition has set us to say that until the 20th of Safar, we continue to remember said the Shuhada, we continue to remember the Zainab Salamullahi Alayha, we continue to remember the 72 Shuhada, and if Mu'mineen, as I said yesterday, if there is no change in me from last Muharram to this Muharram, what tribute have I? And this is the meaning of opening. And what does Imam say? وَإِنَّمَا خَرَجْتُ لِتَهَابِ الْإِسْلَاهِ فِي أُمَّةِ جَدِّ Imam says, I am a reformer. And what we do is, we make tahrif on Imam Hussain al -Islam. The Masai that we recite, Nauzu Billah, Shaykh Ustad Mutahari writes, that if such Masai were to be recited when you are fasting, your fasting would break, your fast would be battle. Meaning that if you recite a wrong hadith while you are fasting, fiqh tells us that that fast is invalidated. So he says that while we mourn Hussein for the tragedy that befell him in Karbala, we too now must mourn of the tragedy that has befallen Hussein on the tahrif and the interpolation and the falsehoods that are being portrayed by two penny poets who come and charge us exorbitant sums of money to try and entertain us. Mu'minin Azad Ali, the Azad of Hussein has now become a commercial venture to say how much money am I going to make out of this ashra, of this ashra that I'll be reciting. This has become a commodity instead of reform. Imam says in explicit terms to say that the society at the time had become corrupt and the ummah of my grandfather has become degenerate. And I am leaving Medina to see that there is Islam. And when we said yesterday, he faces the four corners in Karbala and says, Halmin Nasri Nian Surna. He was proclaiming that to the entire world to say that I have risen up to carry out reform and I am a reformer and any Husseini who is a Husseini must be a reformer beginning with one's own self. Yesterday I shared with you a couplet about Lahore's mosque. Will I have paraphrased it with Imam Hussain al-Islam to say
तुसे फर्श अजा तो बिशादी पल भर में फर्श अजा तो बिशादी पल भर में हुसैन पे रोने वालों ने देट वी हैव क्रिएटेड दिस फर्श अजा दिस प्लेस फॉर मॉर्निंग विद इन विद इन सेकेंड फर्श अजा तो बिशादी पल भर में हुसैन पे रोने वालों ने गिरिया तो हमें इनके रोने पे है जो सदियों में हुसैन ही बन सके देट वी ट्रूली मोर्न देट ओवर दिस इयर्स इफ देर इज नो ट्रांसफॉर्मेशन इफ देर इज नो इश्यू ऑफ दैट रिफॉर्म विच वॉज दी मैसेज ऑफ इमाम हुसैन अलैहिस्सलाम देन मोमिनीन व्हाट हैव वी अचीव्ड इन दिस इज द सेकंड लेक्चर इन द सीरीज टुडे वेयर वी टॉक अबाउट दी रिलीजन इन द रोल ऑफ रिलीजन इन कम्युनिटी डेवलपमेंट इंशाल्लाह वी विल गो थ्रू द अदर लेक्चर्स इन न्यू कोर्स बट आई बिगिन विद द वर्ड्स ऑफ द ब्लेसेड प्रोफेट ही सेड एंड आई कोट Because we are now talking about a society of believers, let us think positive. Let us leave behind the baggage that we had, and look at the beautiful words of the Blessed Prophet. He says, "In their mutual love and compassion, and sympathy for one another, believers are like one body. When one part of it suffers a complaint, when there is pain in one part of the body, all other parts join in." sharing in the sleeplessness and in fever these are the mutual relations that we talk about the idea of the mutual love of believers and as we are taught by maulana mutakiyan ali ibn abi talib alayhi salam when he says to malik ashtar that when you go to mesr you will find two kinds of people you will find your brethren in faith the believers you will also find your equals in creation deal with them with equal justice meaning that this love transcends to humanity also because we are part of the human community as it were and it is our duty in the ghaiba of imam azman ajal allah faraja ta'ala to ensure that we stand up we stand with the imam muslim we serve the 12th imam not by mouthing platitudes not by reciting or every friday the ziyara nor by just reciting the duas but to say here is the work of imam to look after the downtrodden to look after the oppressed with whatever resources that we may have and this truly is the basis of our faith and indeed it was the fulfillment of the mission of the blessed prophet here was a divinely inspired reformist and a disciplinarian yet he showed that kindness and compassion not only to those who belong to the islamic fraternity but also to those outside its fold when the christians of najran come we all know the event of mubahala how many of us know today i will go around and we say that our mosques cannot be made nudges by non muslims entering our mosques this is fiqh and i am not challenging any faqi i am only thinking aloud i am reflecting as a human being i am not passing a fatwa let's i be misunderstood but here was a blessed prophet when the christians of najran said that it is now sunday they had come on saturday to debate with him and when they said it is sunday it is a day of our prayers we would like to go out of town and we would like to have our service the blessed prophet says that this is the mosque of god you can do your service right here this is the pluralism this is the tolerance this is the understanding and this is how he was able to create in medina a morally pure a socially vibrant a racially and religiously coherent and an economic prosperous society history after the prophet dictates otherwise because we lost the vision we lost the goal sakifa changed certain things that's not my subject but i am looking at the medina society and we need to take inspiration from that society so the historic role of the islamic society or the community is to be the true embodiment of the virtuous the wholesome and the noble this is what we learn from the example of the prophet and the imam al-musalla that we set the highest standards of performance 
and become a reference point for others. وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَتَ لِتَقُنُ شُهَدَ عَلَى النَّاسِ That we have made you a nation most balanced so that you may be an example for mankind. So, what kind of example are we? We are one billion Muslims and more and growing every day. Every minute we are increasing because our birth rate is higher than our death rate, except for the Kojas. <laughs> for the Kojas, the birth rate and the death rate is almost the same. So we remain at the level of 124,000, never increase. We are one billion Muslims. What goes on in Pakistan, in Palestine, in Kashmir, in North Africa, and elsewhere in the world today. What is going on? I don't need to reiterate the failed states that we talked about yesterday. Did you know that with all that black gold under Muslim lands in Saudi Arabia, in Iraq, in Iran, everywhere, where you have so much oil that is under those lands, 75% of the world's displaced people, refugees, are from amongst Muslims. This is what we are, this is our state. And the Blessed Prophet foresaw this. This is a hadith that I'm quoting. To say, he said, that there will come a day when the nations will fall upon you like hung hungry eaters or a bowl of food, that you will be so weak. And the people asked him, on that day, is it because we'll be too few? And the answer comes, and the Prophet says, no, on that day, you'll be very many but you will be like the foam on the surface of the current. The current comes, the foam comes, the foam disappears. These are the words prophesied by the Prophet about the idea of the Ummah. So, the count of a billion Muslims is not a count, count of real currency, but of confetti currency, counterfeit currency. It is not the count of the faithful, it is a count of the people who look like the faithful, who claim to be faithful, but who are truly counterfeit. Because if we were one billion, and we were following the Medina society, we were truly following that, then we would not be counterfeit. And that explains that when you have confetti money, our purchasing power is nil. Whenever it comes to any dealings, be it between Israel and Palestine, be it between Iraq and some other country, or Iran and the United States, whatever, truly the Muslims seem to be at the losing end. And you know what happens? We blame everyone else. When you point one finger out there, there are three fingers pointing back at you. The Urdu couplet goes to say, Hasi aati hame hazrat insan par, Hasi aati hame hazrat insan par, Fele badu khud kare lanat kare shaitan par. I am to blame for my counterfeit currency that I have to offer to the world and I blame someone else. This is our fate. So Allama Iqbal says very beautifully that Tum Sayyid biho, Mirza biho, Afghan biho, Tum Sabi kuch khoje biho, Tum Sabi kuch ho batao ke musalman bhi to ho. Because there are classes, the Sayyids to represent the caste system, the Mirza to represent the ruling classes, the Afghanis to represent the differences of Muslims based on religion, language and race. And if you have included Koja as the business class, of course. <laughs> Tell me, are you a Muslim too? These are the questions that we ask. So, when we look at ourselves, and we don't need to extrapolate out there, let us look at ourselves first. Let us look at our own community. We almost seem to be what is termed as an accidental society. We have coexistence because we live in the same geographical location. We have coexistence because we probably go and pray in the same mosque. But there is little cooperation amongst us as communities. In an accidental society, members of the group do not choose each other. They do not choose to have relationships with each other. In fact, an accidental society is one, like people 
on a plane, they purchase a ticket, they don't make inquiries about who the other passengers are going to be. They don't choose. They have a destination to go to. Their motivation is to get to the manzil, to get to the destination. And they get there. That's an accidental society. The people of that society have no rights upon each other, nor do they necessarily need to know each other. All they want to do is get to the, at the best we'll do some minor chit chat on the planes you're sitting to a passenger in the, next, uh, in the next seat and that's all you do. And then when you go, pick up your baggage and off you go never to see that person ever again. That's an accidental society, an example. What we need to look at is an intentional society, an intentional community where there is coexistence and there is cooperation. That members join each other and work together with prior intention, they have a vision, they have a goal. This is what the Muslim Ummah needs to be, not an accidental society, but an intentional society where there is cooperation and realization of a particular object, that there is mutual and reciprocal responsibility. Now, please do not misunderstand me. I'm not casting expressions on the organizations that we already have, which try and do the best that they can. I'm talking generally about the state of the Ummah where we tend to be so focused on our own things and where we sometimes lose effect. Here you have an intentional society where members of a group select each other. They set a criteria for membership for each other so that they can belong to one group and accept the rules made by each member consciously. Today when you look at Western institutions that we are part of too, we live here, we are not transient people. We live here. This is our home. When you look at the institutions that are being created, you can see that they have longevity. You can see that there is a basis of moving forward within that. How many institutions do we have within the OIC, the 50 countries of the OIC, where you see lasting institutions? This is a failing that we need to address. A family is a great example of an intentional society that the husband and the wife choose each other intentionally with a view to lead a common life with common responsibilities that's a family is an intentional society as compared to an accidental society and here we talk about individual responsibility within a society and I'm leading up to something that I would like to try and deliver as succinctly as I possibly can but I need to build this up so please bear with me. The individual responsibility within a society is that an individual is responsible for the common welfare and prosperity of the society. I have a responsibility as a member of the society. And not only to the society, but to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well. Shahid, Shahid Bakr Sal, a great scholar of our time, who was murdered by Saddam Hussein talks about two kinds of judgment in his book on the understanding of the Quran and he says that on the day of judgment there will be two accounts that we will need to give. One is going to be a personal account of what you do but there is also going to be an account said uh, Southern says that it is going to be an account of your interaction in the society that you lived in because there is a responsibility to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on that and therefore it is an individual duty at the same time there is a community's responsibilities that the society is also responsible for the individual's welfare this is where you have a cohort society that we, we will learn about in Medina where the individuals were responsible and so was the society and so much so that look at the pluralism in the time of the Khilafah in Kufa of Imam Ali alayhi Imam sees an old Christian man walking and begging. And Imam says, but you were a strong man. You worked hard. What happened to you? He said, well, I did. But now I have no means of support. And I have to beg. I have no choice. Imam says, this man contributed to society when he was young, when he was fit, when he could serve. He must be paid for Baitul Mahal. He must be paid so that he does not need to beg. 
This is the pluralism. This is the way of Aima where you're looking at a non-Muslim person being paid from Baytul Mal. And here, you know, if we at all try and try and deviate a little bit from the Qums money, there is all kind of issues that will raise and emails will flow like nobody's business to say money has been misappropriated. See what has been done. A non-Muslim has benefited from Imam's money. This is a malaise that comes through when we are so fixated on the issues of, as I said yesterday, a fiqh is a framework. It is not a cage. Fiqh is a framework upon which we can build our society. Fiqh is not a cage that we are put in inside so that we cannot even move. This indeed has to be so that the duties and the rights correspond harmoniously. And that is a concept of Amr bin Maruf and Nayyali An example is given by the Blessed Prophet to say, what is the responsibility of a society? Well, there's a man riding in a boat. He's bought his ticket. He's paid for that. And now the boat is moving. It's in the middle of the ocean. And the man says, this is the space that I bought. It belongs to me. And I start digging a hole in it. The responsibility of the society is to stop him. Because if he does that, the, everybody is going to sink. There is this balance that needs to be done where society has rights upon a human being and the human being has rights upon a society. Unlike the capitalist society, unlike the forgotten Marxist society, where within the Marxism society was all supreme. Within the capitalist fashion, the individual is all supreme. Here is Ummate Wasata being, being taught to us to say that there is a balance between an individual and a society. Both have reciprocal rights and this is the way forward for us as Muslims. Oh. So we need to move on. A human being is a social animal. He needs a society. You cannot escape. A man decided to escape and he said, I don't want this society. So what does he do? He wears one loincloth, goes up on the mountain. Well, one loincloth on the mountain after 15 days, you know what the state is of that loincloth. So he goes to the river and tries to wash the loincloth. Well, a mouse comes and carries the loincloth away. He runs after the mouse, grabs the loincloth back, puts it back, goes to the village and says, I need a cat so that this mouse can be controlled. So he brings a cat up with him on the, on the mountain. Well, after two days, the cat wants to want some milk. So he has to go back to the village and bring a cow. And with the cow, he had to bring somebody to look after the cow. And the person who brought the cow had to bring his wife and his children. Pretty soon, the entire village was up with him. You cannot, afford, you cannot escape society. A human being is a social animal. He has to live in a society. And this is what Allah Iqbal says so beautifully. And he said, for the time, that a human being is indeed connected to the community alone he is nothing the idea of the stream the power in the stream that is flowing is where the flow is if you stand on the bank not join the society you will not move and therefore, we need a society. But in order to have a society which is fruitful, in order to have a society which is progressive, we need to understand the development phases of a society. Now, this is something that may not normally be saved from podiums of this nature. I beg your forgiveness. But this is something that needs to be conveyed. And I crave your attention just for a few minutes. And inshallah, we will conclude. There are groups, communities, who normally move through four stages. There's a stage where people come together. I call it a pseudo-community. And then there is a process of chaos. And then there is a process of emptiness. And then you come back to a real community. I will elaborate on that. A pseudo-community is one where we come together as human beings with a common goal. And we will try to achieve 
perfect unity within a very short of period of time. Maybe it's a kun fai kun to say, when everybody's together, now we're going to have wonderful unity. In reality, this does not happen. And we are unwilling to acknowledge our failure in trying to do that. So what do we do? We fake it. We attempt to form this instant community by being extremely pleasant to each other. Being very politically correct when we talk to each other. And we try and avoid all disagreement. Because, you know, we, this is unity. You know, the unity of the community will break. So we cannot really say what we want to say. Anything that is perceived as controversial, new or challenging, must be avoided at all costs because we'll upset people in the community. We're trying to bring unity. And the appearance of harmony and oneness must be maintained. And this is a pseudo-community because we are in a state of denial. This is the first stage of trying to form a community. These pseudo-communities are shallow, they're built upon illusions, they're well-meaning, but they're destined to fail. Because what happens is, from uniformity, the pseudo-community, if we do not mature, that uniformity now breeds conformity. I try to bring uniform, uniformity. You know, I cannot say these things. So, instead of asking the question, how are we the same? What are our common goals? Where do we want to go as a society, as a community? What do we do? I ask, what do I do to belong here? You know, be part of this community here. I must be politically correct. Will I rock the boat if I say something in a community? What do I have to do? So I can remain part of this group without being excommunicated or excluded. This is a pseudo-community where discussion is shunned. Open thinking, reflection is suppressed to say, no, 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 no. You should not say that about X, Y, Z. You should not actually even discuss the issue of Marjai at all because these Marajai are sacrosanct. You can't touch them. This Stifling of thought is a pseudo-community. There needs to be a maturity where we are able to understand that to grow, we must move from the stage of these pleasantries. And we will realize that while we all live under the same sky, we have different horizons. We are human beings. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the intellect. Kuwa akaliya. To think and to be creative. We have a right to think. We have a right to doubt. Because doubt is a form that from doubt you will go to certainty. You are not born with certainty. We have a right. We have a God-given right to think and reflect. That we are not all the same. We can have differences. It's how we deal with our differences. Is a key to understand. So, by promoting a community based upon uniformity on some accepted religious form and tradition, we become fixated, stagnant in the pseudo state and we don't move. And as I said yesterday, the perfume bottle, we continue to admire. We haven't opened that bottle of Chanel number no. five. It's a beautiful bottle, the packaging is so good. But I have not because I am comparing form. It is not the essence that I am worried about because I now believe and I perceive that that form is my actual spiritual experience. And then like Mullah Nasruddin spell, I am looking for it. And I can't find it. He said, where is the spirituality? Well, where can the spirituality come if I haven't opened the bottle and put it to my nose and enjoy the nice, pleasant scent of the uh, bottle of Chanel number no. 5. So this is where the form becomes central to our belief. And this is something that we need to understand. That the focus of the pseudo-community is to preserve the status quo. That is why within our Imam Bargas, I dare say this, what we have is home sickness center. Why do I say that? I like to create a little bit of Moshi. I was born there. 
So I'd like to see a little bit of Moshi in my Imam Barga back in Los Angeles. I'd like to see a little bit of Karachi or a little bit of Dar es Salaam. So I go there and I feel good, you know. The same Noha that were being recited in Moshi, I feel good. Because I'm homesick. Well, our children, the next generation growing up here does not need homesickness centers. What it means is wellness centers, which is going to breathe fresh air into this community so that we are able to progress and move away from the pseudo communities that we sometimes tend to be so fixated in within our little boxes. And this indeed is a, a, a trial because the next phase then, as I said, is that you go into a state of chaos. Because too many questions being asked, people start reflecting and we have a right to reflect because we are told in the Quran, Do they not ponder on the Quran? All this time, are there locks in their hearts? So once we start reflecting, once we start thinking, we keep some thoughts to ourselves. You know, we are very cautious to say, well, if I say this aloud, and Chacha hears this and he'll we'll take it to two other people, then I'm going to be in trouble because of my comments. So I keep to myself. This is something where chaos begins. And the beginning of chaos is where you start asking those questions. And sometimes people think of chaos as conflict. We have young people asking questions. We have older people asking questions. We're asking questions. What are we as a community? Chaos is not conflict. To reflect, to ask, to be in doubt is not a bad thing. As long as your, your intention is to go and find the truth ultimately. If you are doing it for the sake of creating an argument, you know that yourself. You can fool everybody else, you can't fool your own self. And you know, you can be the best judge, nobody else can judge. But if you have that, then in reality, the constructive aspect of chaos is in fact the very seedbed of creativity. And this is where you go. So, then chaos is sometimes a time where we struggle. You know, I know the, the way this thing should be, and the way I should be, and the way the whole community should be. And this is part and parcel of that chaos of having opinions and views. There is nothing wrong with that, as long as we are able to manage those discussions in a civil fashion where we can say that I disagree with you but I respect your right to have that view. That is a maturity where the community can then go on to next thing. And in the interest of time, I had a beautiful Nasruddin story for you. Inshallah some other day I'd like to move on with the subject to say the way to get out of chaos sometimes is Okay, let's organize ourselves. And we coaches are pretty good at that. Just say, form a task force. And we'll try and get out of this. We have a huge issue burning. Form a task force. Sukumambele, as they say. You know, you form a task force, give it to a committee. You know what's the definition of a camel is? It's a horse designed by a committee. So, you give it to a committee and you try and get out of chaos as a pseudo community. Organizing such things without understanding only delays the chaos temporarily. But until and unless, Momin, you go through that stage of emptying out your prejudices, your preconceived ideas, your practices, your traditions, and question them genuinely, unless you empty out the fresh wellness issue will not enter into you. And that has to happen from a pseudo community to chaos which is needed and then moving on to that emptying saying, let me empty out, let me not have preconceived ideas, let me look at the Medina Charter, let me look at the life of Ali Islam, let it not be through the filter of somebody else, let it be through my own intellect so that I can understand what Mulay Muta can. Ali ibn Abi Talib al-Islam meant when he talked about the concept of justice, for example. He's in front of the second caliph and he, a plaintiff has accused Imam Ali of something and the 
plaintiff is called and says, Fulham and Fulham come and sit here, as was a tradition that the plaintiff and the defendant would both sit next to each other. And then he says, Oh, Abul Hassan, please come and grace this place, the second caliph says. And Imam's brow, there was a frown on his face. And he says, is it that you don't like to sit next to the plaintiff? We can organize a special place for you. And he says, you don't understand, do you? That by calling him with his name, Fula bin Fula, and by calling me with my kunya, oh, Abu Hassan, please come, you have already shown favor to me. You are not fit to be a judge. This is the acute sense of justice within a human being that Imam al-Islam teaches. We don't need any filters. We don't need any, anybody to come and tell us about this justice. If we truly imbibe that. So the idea is that emptiness of preconceived notions and prejudices. But for that to happen, the self must die. It is the opposite of Kodiko Karbalandikna. It is the opposite. Here the self must die. The goal is to become a community of believers united in the spirit of pure Tawheed which needs to be understood and so for us to move forward. Otherwise to say, well, it's my way, this is the way I think and I'm not emptied out, is a philosophy of failure. So for the community to live, the self, the ego must die. And then the community stage where we must be unafraid to examine our beliefs and practices, our forefathers practice. But you know what our forefathers really practiced four or five generations ago? They believed that Imam Ali al-Islam was the tenth incarnation of Lord Vishnu. This is what our forefathers believed. For better or for worse. This is history of our community. So we question, we move through. The idea is to examine our beliefs and practices. And if necessary, if we feel we need to make a change, then we must embrace that change. Because we are told in Surah al Rad, Allah does not change the condition of the people unless they make that change within themselves. This is what we are. So by emptying ourselves of those expectations, we create the space for true listening, for healing, and for the connection. Inshallah, we will continue with this concept of the community and as to how we learn. But I crave your attention for five very quick minutes. I know I've exceeded my time by about two to three minutes. I crave five more minutes, if I may, that we learn. Habil and Kabil had a fight. Kabil kills his brother Habil. You know how human beings learn how to bury their dead? Kabil did not know what to do with his brother's body. A crow came and was burying a dead crow. Human beings learned how to bury the dead from a crow. So I would like to offer us some lessons from geese. Have you ever seen these geese who fly in beautiful V formation? The lessons from geese is that they know that as each one flies, the uplift from the birds in that V formation adds 71% greater flying range than if each bird flew alone. This is community. So the lesson we learn is that people who share a common direction and a sense of community can get to where they're going quicker and easier because they're traveling on the thrust of each other. This is what we learn from the geese. And then the second lesson is that one fails out of formation, it suddenly feels the drag of flying alone, it quickly moves back into the formation to take advantage. That means I cannot leave the society. If we were to learn as much sense as a goose, then we'll stay in formation, we'll stay with the community. And we're willing to accept help and give help to, eat, to others. The third lesson is that when a goose tires, it rotates back. In groups where there's encouragement, the production is much greater. And lastly, when one goose gets sick or shot down, two of them step out of formation. They follow it, protect it until either it's able to fly again or it dies. If we had as much sense as this geese, then we would stand by each other in difficult times as well as when we are strong. 
I mean, that is the idea of a society moving forward, and this is a lesson that we learn from this. And this was a society very soon after the passing away of the Blessed Prophet, that Imam leaves Medina, and now normally we recount that he also leaves Makkah. Imam was there. Can you imagine the pain and the hurt that Imam Hussein had when he had to turn his Hajj into Umrah and decide so as not to desecrate the holy places because he knew what Yazid and his troops were up to. Well, I mean, this is a journey that we are recounting. And Imam said so very clearly that those who will come with me are going to face a sure death. The people who joined him were those people who were committed to follow him in his revolution. Those were the Ansars, those were the companions of Imam Hussein al-Islam. Today as we sit and mourn and remember, how many of us have that spirit of self-sacrifice to compare with those companions to say that we too are on the journey with Imam Hussein al-Islam as the companions for the sake of social justice for the sake of justice, for the sake of seeing that the downtrodden and the oppressed are taken care of. Just one recounting to say that he hears about Muslim Ibn Akil. And when the caravan stops for me, this is where when the news comes, he calls the daughter. He calls the daughter and the daughter says, why, uncle, are you looking at me as if I'm an orphan? And Imam says, from today, consider me as your father. What could he say? This began the martyrdom of Karbala. Inna lillahi wa inna ilahi rajimu. Every day it cuts me inside. I'm so very far from your side. I would give away these eyes. Just to catch a glimpse of your shrine If I have to cross the seas And every desert in between I will come crawling to you, Hussein I will come crawling to you, Hussein